The title of my lesson today is Keep Hope Alive. We need to keep hope alive. It's so easy to lose hope. And oftentimes we can put our hope in so many other things. Sometimes even hope can be shattered. They even say in the Bible, you know, hope deferred makes the heart what? Yeah. And so oftentimes we need hope so we can continue to grow, but not only just grow, so we can continue to change and be the men and women God's desire right. for us to be. Yeah. You know, what does that phrase mean, keep hope alive? It means even if something seems to become more and more unlikely, you don't stop believing. Okay. You know, oftentimes, People could mix faith and hope and like, you know, think that they're like, kind of like interchangeably, right? Uh, but very much there, to my, honestly, to my knowledge, more so this week studying it out, is they're actually very much distinct. We know this to be the case because in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says like, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And it's interesting, like the greatest gifts Two of the three, faith and hope, they're listed separately. Yeah. I never knew that. I actually thought they were kind of like the same. So faith, we understand this from the scriptures in Hebrews 11. One is faith is confidence in what we hope for. Yeah. Right? Faith is a complete trust or confidence in something or someone. However, hope, biblical hope that is, is built on faith. Yes. Hope is the earnest ex anticipation that comes with believing in something good. Yeah. And we all hope for a lot of things. I know I hope to one day be out of debt. Some of you guys can relate if you were in school and college one day. Some of us still got student loans. Some of us maybe have IRS debt. A lot of us, we hope for different things. Some of us hope for a new car, hope for a girlfriend, hope for a, a husband, a, a, a wife. And sometimes it may not be those things. Sometimes for some of us, we hope to have good health. Yeah. <laughs> we all hope in a lot of things. Also in hope, is something that's not seen. As it says in Romans 8, 24, it says that hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Yes. No one. Mm -hmm. And for many of us in this room, our hope is in God and God's word. Don't we can't see God. Even for some, maybe just having a relationship with God is like something very much very new for you. And though yet we can't see God, yet we can learn through God through the scriptures. As it says in Romans 15, 4, that everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that everything taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide might have, give us hope, right? And so for many of us, we put our hope in different things. And with hope, and having great hope, it, it helps you stay at an optimistic mind. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it keeps you thinking positive. It, thinks you, it helps you not just think positive, but also be in a good, cheerful mood when you're very hopeful. So anything opposite of that, we know, is kind of like hopeless, maybe not so fired up. Maybe just very cynical. It's the opposite. But however, the message I have in my heart is not to, to call us to, 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 to be hopeless. The message of my heart is to call us to be hopeful. Come on. So we got to keep hope alive. And we're going to look in the story in the Bible of a man named Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to look at the story of Nehemiah. And we're going to look at a guy who had hope. Not only for himself, but it's for his family, for his community, yet alone the known world during that day and age. I only have three quick points for you guys. And today's lesson is a little bit different uh, than usual. Today is going to be more like a certain union. We're, we're looking at the scriptures, but also we've got to examine ourselves. And see where we're at in the Bible. Come on, bro. And my first point for you here this morning is keeping hope alive during times of brokenness and downfall. Come on, bro. 
Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's pick it up here in verse 1. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Akala. Some interesting words that I hear during this day and age. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, had a night, one of the brothers came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. We'll pause here real quick. As you continue to read on throughout this passage, you start to see Nehemiah really go to God in prayer. And he goes to God in prayer, and he, and he puts the request before the king at this time, was King Artaxerxes. And uh, it was during the time period of around 466 BC, 50 years already since the temple's been built. Right. And the temple was destroyed up before to this time, as well as the walls. It was destroyed by, you know, the enemies of God during this time, which, which was the Babylonians. Yeah. And so, just imagine the sight, and just imagine the, the, the hearing of what has transpired up until this point. Here in Nehemiah, a guy who's so connected to his people, a guy who's so concerned about his people and the conditions of where they were at, and he gets this news that it's not good news at all. No. It's terrible news. It's actually bad news. And his heart just breaks. He understands the condition of the walls. It was broken. And during this time, the walls were super pivotal for most cities. During this time period, uh, the strength of a city was determined and measured by its walls. Right. That's why in Isaiah 26, 1, it says, In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God makes salvation its walls and its ramparts. Wow. Meaning that the strength, it, it was, it was going to lie, it, it provided the fit so that the enemies could be left out. And it says in that scripture in Isaiah 26, it talks about God made salvation its walls and ramparts. Yeah. That salvation means that everyone within the wall will be sold out disciples. Amen. On a unified standard, which was God's word. But the moment when those walls start to become flimsy, the moment when those walls become to deteriorate and, and start to compromise, it's scary. And it's a sad sight. And it's happened before. Yeah. That that wall of discipleship, man, within the church, we have to keep it high and strong like it talks about in Revelation 21-12. And how we keep that wall high and strong is our ideas, our ideals must be the standard. Mm -hmm. Come on. And this is the standard, isn't it? Yeah. God's word is the standard. It equips us and it gives us the blueprint of how to actually build the walls of Christianity. Amen. And here, going back to the scripture in Nehemiah, here God allowed the walls to be destroyed. Wow. God allowed it to happen. Wow. Due to the sin of God's people. Come Due to the lack of spirituality of God's people. And not only that, it didn't just affect them individually, sadly it affected their families. It affected the, the city, the, the entire nation during this time. Wow. Up until this point, God dwelt in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. The temple was there. Solomon built it. Mm -hmm. But yet, it got destroyed. Mm -hmm. And to the point where the people were so enslaved that they were taken captive and basically took over to Babylon. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now Nehemiah gets word and his brothers are coming to him. And it's usually the messenger gives good news, but it's not good news. And with Nehemiah, his heart just went out. His heart breaks. Yeah. Let's pick it up here in verse 11 in chapter 2. What was his response? It says in verse 11 in chapter 2, it says, I went to Jerusalem. So he actually, instead of running from it, he went straight into it. He went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was writing on. 
that was either like a donkey or a horse during this time, right? Yeah. And so verse 13, by night I went out through the valley gate through, uh, toward the jackal wheel and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mouth to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because I had yet had said anything to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials of any others who will be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. And its gates have been burnt with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Wow. We got to think about it during this time period. Like the Jewish people were so pride. They took so much pride in who they were. Mm -hmm. They were God's chosen people up to this point. But yet, their nation is destroyed. Mm -hmm. And yet, the schools that they probably built up is torn down. Their homes is no longer a home anymore. It's not safe. And what was Nehemiah's response? He goes straight to Jerusalem. And he goes and he examines the wall for really what's, really what's left of it. it it's, it's said that some scholars believe that the walls were just rubble. And we know this to be the case because as you look at the text, Nehemiah is on his mount and he's going through the city, but in some areas he can't even enter because it's so much destruction. To the point he had to kind of get off his mount and kind of continue to kind of roam and look around. That's how bad it got. However, his heart was to rebuild. To start all over again. And sometimes that's not a bad thing. Right. Sometimes you just, you just, God puts you where, he, where you are, amen. That's where you at. But sometimes it's not bad to start all over again. Yeah. Being able to learn from the past mistakes. You know, I think about my, my life, honestly, just to be vulnerable and share with you guys. Um, even as a leader, even as you guys, as your leader, I go in so many areas. I mean, sin is obvious. You could probably just, man, like, still up there with one shoe on, huh? <laughs> you know? <laughs> man, your speech is not as sharp as it needs to, right? Like, it's areas I know I got flaws in. But I think the one that really kind of, really almost took me out, honestly, um, it's my first year of marriage. You know, I, I never grew up with the idea or an example of what a marriage should look like godly, in a godly way, based on what the scriptures teach. However, that's not, never an excuse as well. I'm not exempt from that. But I, I think my choices and my actions was just very much poor, even as a minister. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's times that, that was allowed within my marriage. And it's due, really due to my lack of character and my lack of leadership. You know, and, and, and my whole entire life, I, I strive to be a better man, a, a better person than what my community had to offer at the time. You know, growing up in, in public housing, growing up where a lot of people, only thing their vision was just beyond those boundaries within their neighborhood. Anything outside of that, they didn't think of. Mm. And so, you know, have an opportunity to go to college and yet uh, get a scholarship to play uh, uh, collegiate sports. On the outside, it's like, man, he's doing it. He, he's successful. He's doing something great, especially as a black man yeah. in America. You follow me? Yeah. And on the outside, it looks like he's doing well. But inside, man, I lack the character. And so I can kind of put up that facade over a period of time. But eventually, guess what? The character catches up with you. Yeah. And it wasn't until me being in my first year, second year, even to a degree, in my marriage, where the type of words I used to use before I became a disciple, I start to compromise and start to kind of ripple back into my life again. You follow me? Uh, the poor choices of words, words rather than building up, it was words to tear down. But yet, I call myself a Christian in the kingdom of God. Being a minister in the kingdom of God. And it didn't stop there. 
the, 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 the frustration, the anger, the impatience, all these little things that make you look a little edgy because things wasn't going as you had hope or plan. Really caused me to not see the deceitfulness of, of really just my, my spiritual eyes, if you will. Because in my mind, I'm like, well, I, you know, I'm doing okay. It's not as bad. Because you, you, could, you could kind of play some comparison, like, well, it's not as bad as it used to be before I became a, a Christian. But sin is sin. There's no levels to it. And for me, I think God was just keeping me there so I could take ownership of my shortcomings and my downfall. To the point where God has his ways to really get your attention. Because there was still some lack of repentance in that area. And sadly, you have to fast forward. You know, God had to put me in some places where I just needed to be, to be humbled out. Honestly, just this past, not year, but maybe a year and a half, I think, you know, God allowed a situation to happen. Um, and sometimes I love to work and work super hard. And what that can do, it can, it can affect my family. And though as a man, like my purpose and my hope is like to provide for my family, but yet as men, we love to work. Yeah. God designed us that way. But I can overcompensate so much for the work and I can neglect my family, my wife, my kid. But sometimes I, I try to spend so much time over here, then eventually it's like, it feels like, at least it feels like, I'm neglecting work. And so as a young man, a young Mary, uh, been in a young marriage, uh, a young leader who's, who's trying to figure it out, honestly. I blew it at times. And to the point where sometimes it, it made me frustrated because I wanted to do good. I was hoping to do good. And, and a lot of times we have in our minds like, well, this is what I aspire to be. But we got to be re realistic of who we really are and who we actually are. Right? So you got your, as, your, your aspirations versus your real self. <laughs> And honestly, the real self, I didn't want to look in the mirror because it reminded me so much of my father. It, it reminded me of so much of what I was trying not to be. But actually, deep down inside is who I am actually am. And yet, I love my fa father. There's no shade to him. I'm grateful that he was in my life. And to the, to the best of his abilities... But it was just character aspects of his life where I seen that he wasn't the leader of the household. He didn't lead his family. But yet, I didn't want to be like that, but yet that's exactly what I was doing. Not truly leading my family. Actually, I was so deceived. I'm thinking I'm leading my family because, oh, we're getting baptisms. Oh, we've been successful. Oh, we're, we're, we're appointed now. But I was actually hurting it. Man, it wasn't to a point when I, I got frustrated one day and uh, just because of my shortcomings, amen. Uh, I ended up punching the floor because of that, the, the fits of rage and, the, and the, uh, the, the anger at times. Just because I, I play sports and you go mask it then, right. now I have to deal with the real character of who, truly who I am without God or when, who I could be like when I'm not close to God. Yeah. You follow me? Yeah. And so I have to go through surgery, all these different things, but it didn't stop there. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm a, someone, sometimes I can take my sin light. I don't know if you, you could, some guys, oh, yeah. you take your sin, like, it's like the whole world just collapsed. And then you just distraught, discouraged. And some people take their sin light you, where something worse got to actually happen. Right. You know, and for me, I found myself in a hospital, on a hospital bed. And now in the hospital, they do these things now where they kind of ask you about your, maybe your, your faith or your religion. Just because they want to be sensitive to people, maybe who faith is, maybe they can't take a prescription or whatever. Maybe they want to be sensitive to that. So guess what? The nurse asked me, like, hey, so what, 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 uh, what's your background? What's your faith? I was like, I'm Christian. And, and, and in my mind, I'm like, dang, I feel such a, like a hypocrite right now. Mm -hmm. And she, and, and, and God used her to kind of like disciple me, like kind of give me some words of encouragement there. She's like, don't in the Bible it says this? And I'm like, dang. <laughs> dang. But it didn't stop there. God really was wanting me to learn this lesson. Uh, at the time, I was working full-time in a ministry, which is awesome. But I was full-time, but not really full-time. I was full-time on paper, but yet I had to work some multiple jobs just to kind of make ends meet. I was living in the Bay Area. It's expensive there, right? Some of you guys can relate, being in L.A. It's still yeah. different. Uh, and so I was working the multiple jobs, even being full-time in a ministry and still leading a lot of people. 
Um, it felt a lot of pressure there, and I think it was just unwanted pressure I put upon myself. It wasn't like someone was breathing down my neck, like, bro, you need to do this and do this and do this. I think I was just wanting to inspire to do so well. I put the weight upon myself that was very much unhealthy, right? Which led me into the hospital. But at my job, now I'm starting to recover. At my job, I have this big old cast on my head now, and I served as a barista. You know, shout out to those who love Starbucks, whatever. I was, I was a good Starbucks barista. And usually, you know, um, you could do work, barista work, but I think since I was limited in my ability, obviously, I was only able to uh, serve as the cashier. And so, usually every time there's a customer coming in, and they're interacting with the cashier. Right. And just gotta think about this. Just, just picture this for a second. This tall guy who was very obvious already because his height with the big old cast. <laughs> very noticeable. You can't hide. Yeah. But yet the guilt and the shame would be there a little. I'm like, man, God is really teaching me. Mm. And uh, one customer out there next. So what happened? Oh, I'm like, hey. <laughs> I'm a Christian, I gotta be honest, you know? But I'm gonna go through the, soul, the, the, the long story, you know? But just one after another. What happened, what happened? I was thinking like, you know what? It's interesting how God works. In some sin or lies, yes, you forgive. And I think, obviously, I believe in the Bible, God says, you know, when you have faith and you confess your sins and you walk in a light, he's, he's able to purify you, right? And forgive those sins. So my sins were forgiven, but yet, it's some sins that God can forgive, but the consequences you still have to live with. Yeah. Right. And there's some sins that God forgives, but guess what? Some things you may forget, which is awesome. God can write that a clean slate. But sometimes God allows for you to remember it so you never forget. Amen. And I think for me, it was just like, man, I think God is making sure I never forget my bonehead decision. Amen. Amen. But thank God for the kingdom. Thank God for the, the, the disciple. Thank God for his word. Because striving and actually choosing to repent and to change, man, I got better in that. Now, is the temptation still there? Of course it is. Of course. I still have a job to, to serve and, and, and meet the needs of a lot of people. I still have my incredible wife, JL. Thank God. I still have an incredible family. So the temptation is still there, but now I have learned how to just navigate it in a more godly way. Amen. And so like Nehemiah, going back to the text, sometimes we can examine the walls of other people's lives of discipleship. But let alone, Nehemiah had to examine the life of himself and then kind of move forward to progress to take care of the walls around him. And so in the same way for us, we oftentimes, even as Christians, could be the most critical people there is on this earth. <laughs> However, it's so easy to point the sword at the other person. But are we pointing the sword at ourselves? Come on, Terry. Come on. I want to call us to make a decision here today to examine truly where you are before God. Amen. Examine your hearts, examine your minds. And sometimes you may think you are doing fine, just like I, I can be at times, I can be deceitful in my way of thinking. The best way to find out is how do you treat other people? Yeah. A great indicator for where you're at with God is just really how you love other people. Because yeah. the Bible says you can't love God and not love people. Right. Yeah. You can't love God and claim to love God who you can't see, <laughs> let alone hate is critical don't believe in whatever may be or telling the person down that's in your life who you do see. Mm -hmm. Come on. I want to call you as my brother and sister to examine yourself. Come on, Terry. Come on, awesome. See where you're at. Oh, yeah. But repent and change it. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Point number two. Keep your hope alive during opposition. Let's go back to Nehemiah and we'll pick it up here in verse four. Yeah. You know, Nehemiah begins to build the wall, which is awesome. However, we understand that even as a kingdom, once we start building, guess what? Opposition is right there. Yeah. Let's go to Nehemiah 4. And we'll pick it up here in verse 1. It says, when Sambalit heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews in his presence of the associates in the army of Samaria. He said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Would I restore their wall? 
When they offer sacrifices, when they finish the day, can they bring stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burnt as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, you got the other guy like, yeah, man. What are they building? I mean, even a fox climbing on a wall, it would break down a wall of stones. Verse 4. He says, hear us, O God, for we are despised. Have you ever felt despised? Yeah. Yeah. He says, turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Wow. Yeah. So we rebuilt the wall to all of it reach half its height. For the people work with all their heart. Come on. Verse 7, but when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Mm -hmm. This got even more intense. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the labor is given out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them, and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Verse 12, then the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, whoever you turn, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Wow. Keeping hope alive during opposition. Yeah. You know, by this time, Nehemiah, he started to not just have this, this vision and sense predicated on his heart, but he, he kind of infused it into the hearts of his people. And they start to work together, rebuilding a wall one at a time. And they start to reestablish re the different gates to rebuild up the wall the way how it was supposed to be built. But however, as they were rebuilding, the good is happening, but also we learn opposition begins to take place. And if you look at, back at the text, and it's interesting, the more forceful you try to become for God and, 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 and do godly things, it seems like the more that force of opposition try to respond back to you. Yeah. Check this out. Look at verse 1, Sambalit. He was the kind of like the, the Satan character in this story. It starts out with him being angry. But drop down to verse 7, he has a crew down. Yeah. It's interesting. The more, the more forceful you become, guess what? Satan becomes that much more forceful to respond back to you. Yeah. So what should be our response? We got to be even more forceful than that. Yeah. Yeah. And we see it started out with Tobiah, then it becomes Tobiah and his friends, and they still are opposing God's people. And to the point we see this whole battle between good and evil, light and dark, mm -hmm. Satan and God. And it's no different than today's time, to be honest. Right. The whole idea of between good and evil, light and dark, the forces of good and the forces of darkness. Mm. And let's just see Nehemiah's heart was like, hey, we still got to build this thing. I don't care what opposition is happening. We got to build this for our mighty God. Amen. Amen. You just see where his faith is. Let's see the faith of the people externally. Well, it says that they were angry. So we know that they didn't like, they didn't want that happening, right? So external opposition. What? Let's think about God's people. Look at verse 10. It says, meanwhile, the people in Judah, God's people, Hell, hell, line of Judah, right here. The people of Judah. On, At this bro. point, they're like, hey, the strength of the labor is given out. Can we really do this? Mm. It, it's, it, it's too much pressure on them. But when you study Jesus' ministry, man, they, they were radicalized. Mm. And we still talk about it to this day. But yet here, and for some even, maybe even in this room. Can we really do that? There's so much rubble like, wow. that we cannot rebuild the wall. Can we really do it? Can we really, can we really evangelize the entire world? Come on, bro. 
And then verse 12, it says, then the Jews who lived near them, sadly, one got poisoned. Guess what? You poisoned the next person. And now everybody getting poisoned, right? Because of the faithlessness. This is the same thing that took the people out and they can't even go into the promised land because of the faithlessness of the people, the hopelessness yeah. wow. as we talk about hope. And it says, hey, wherever they turn, they will attack us. We're going to come to an end. It's going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Faithlessness can kill a movement. Yeah. yeah. Come on, talk about it, babe. Sin can kill a movement. Mm -hmm. Hopelessness can kill the movement. Mm -hmm. And like I said, how do we respond to this threat? Because the threat is there. Right. To be honest, we can't be naive and, and think that we're just going to like build up God's kingdom and plant ship in Los Angeles? Are you kidding me? Right. Satan is like, oh, this is the mecca of, uh, of, of false advertisement. This is the mecca of entertainment. This is the mecca of leading people to hell. You think you can have a church here and change people's lives? You think you can baptize? You think you can restore people back to, to, to God? Oh, oh. Okay. 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 Come on, Terry. Come on, baby. You, you, you said that's your spouse right there? Let's see how they're doing spiritually right now. Mm. Oh, wait. Is that your child? No. Okay. How can I take this person out? Wow. How can I discourage it? Oh, finances. Yes. Pandemic. Perfect. Just like we're in this, in this room, worshiping God, dreaming and scheming, guess what? Satan is doing the exact same thing. The exact same thing. He has his own movement. He has his own movement. And sometimes the best way for him to just take you by is just make you think that you're on the right side. Make you think that you're in the right place. Make you think that you're in the right place spiritually. And sadly, you're really wasting away. And the great indicator of that is, hey, who's building? Right. Who's building? Even Jesus says, hey, either you with me or you against me, yeah. right? Either you building up the kingdom or you tearing it down. And for some, like, well, I didn't decide anything. Well, guess what? Even in your indecision, right. it's still a decision. Right. You decide whether you don't want to build the kingdom. And guess what? This is not who we are in this room. We are those who answer the call to build up God's kingdom. Are you with me? This is why we're here, to worship God and to build up his kingdom. Yes. And this is where we need to be every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this scene in this, I love football, there's this movie called Fighting the Giants. Ooh. And the scene takes place on a football field. And the kid, you know, he speaks with no faith and he's just hopeless. Right. But yet he has this coach in his life. And sometimes we need someone who's like a coach figure in our lives. Maybe it's your leader, maybe it's not. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's your parent. For a lot of us, it needs to be God. <laughs> right. yeah. it's, it, it's someone, right? right? However, the coach didn't look at him the way he looked at himself. The coach looked at him like, man, this guy got so much potential. He got so much potential. And so, but the coach is trying to teach this kid who's on the team. He's like, you know what? I want you to do this, this death crawl. You know, for some of us who are probably familiar with that, it was basically like you get on all fours, you're like crawling. And a football field is like 110 yards. So he had to kind of crawl the whole field. Uh, and the kid was like, well, I, you know, I, I can do it. But the, the coach didn't want him just to do it, but he was trying to push him. Right. Because we all can do it, but God just don't want us just, just to do it. He, he wants to push us yeah. to our full potential. You follow me? Yeah. yeah. And so the young player starts out, you know, questioning, like, whether they actually had what it takes to even defeat their opponents who they were going to face. And so the coach like, hey, you already count, you know, uh, Friday night uh, is down as a loss. <laughs> You're already kind of, like, thinking about that as a loss already in your mind. And so the coach tells them, like, hey, all right, I want you to promise me to give, you, give uh, me your absolute best. I want you to do the death crawl. So Brock's like, okay, I'll do it. And he's like... Do you want me to go to the 30? You think about the field, right? And it's like, do you want me to go to the 30? The coach said, I think you go to the 50. He's pushing him. Wow. 
And Brock says, well, I can go to the 50 if no one is on my back. The coach replies, I think you could go to the 50 with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can't, Brock, you must promise me that you'll do your absolute best. Brock promises with the little mustard seed of faith he had, right? <laughs> and the coach is like, well, awesome. But I'm going to do a blindfold. Ooh, stakes are high. Ooh, okay. And, you know, obviously we all understand that visual blindfolded. You couldn't see anything. Kind of represents the scripture in Hebrews 11, 1. Right. That faith is confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And so Brock begins crawling, you know, one by one. He's pushing himself one by one. And, and, and the coach is like right there with him. The coach just didn't let him be. The coach is there cheering him on the entire time, training him, correcting him, rebuking him, pushing him. One step at a time. Come on, Brock. One step at a time. And Brock passes the 50. Eventually, he ends up to the 40, to the 30, to the 20, to the 10, and he's in the end zone. Wow. Brock is tired, exhausted. The coach says to Brock, you are the most influential person on this team. If you walk around defeated, so are they. Wow. Don't tell me you can't give me more than what I've been seeing. You just carried a 140 pound man on your back. And Brock, I need you. God gifted you with the ability of leadership. Don't waste it. Mm. And he asked Brock this question. Can I count on you? Can I count on you? Brock replies with been exhausted, just gave his whole heart, to be honest. But also realizing and starting to see his full potential. And Brock replies, yes. Then Jeremy, you know, and the, and the coach is still kind of coaching him up, and, and the coach is like, what, Jeremy? You know, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and uh, Jeremy actually interrupts the coach and he says, hey, coach, I actually weigh 160 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Indicate what? That Brock can do more than we thought he could. And the only thing the coach was calling him to do is do his best. For some of us in this room, we can compare ourselves to the other person. And God's like, hey, why, do you, why are you so focused on that person? I called you. You made the decision to follow me. I just need you to do your best. It doesn't matter what your health condition is. Hey, Amen. Give me your best. Come on, bro. I, I don't care about the, the financial hardship. Amen. I can take care. Just give me your best. And we got to ask ourselves, even in this room, how have we responded to opposition? Mm. But really, if we put this pressure upon ourselves, and God's like, dude, you don't even need that. I just need your best. I need your faithfulness. I need your commitment. I'll do the rest. For us to realize our full potential and truly who we are in the eyes of God. Yeah. And the only for that to happen, we got to dig deep down inside and understand truly who we are in God's eyes. Right. As his spiritual sons and spiritual daughters. Mm -hmm. That God already said that we could do more than we could ever ask for. That God already said, like, hey, I'll give you the land. Mm -hmm. You just need to go take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a promise already that, that was already still. God's word never comes back empty handed. Every single promise of God was already fulfilled. Yes. Wow. Come on. Why are you going to give God your best Come on. and take it? Amen. You know, I want to challenge this. We got to build up God's kingdom. Right. This is why we need to have the vision for Southland. This is why we need to rebuild the walls here in this region mm -hmm. with the goals of, of reaching 100 sold out disciples. Yeah. At one point, it was like that. But the walls, maybe over time, we got hit. Mm -hmm. We got hit. Amen. Satan hit us. But guess what? Are oh, we going to respond? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Let's rebuild the specialized ministries, our CR ministry, our Brave Hearts ministry. But guess what? Yeah. One person can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. We need everyone involved. Come on. Yes. Come on, babe. I'm so proud of our shepherds in training. Woo! The shepherds of training who answered that call to build up God's kingdom. I'm so proud of those in this room. Even in the midst of a pandemic, you're still fighting and you're still faithful. Amen. That's to be committed to as well. Amen. Yeah. I want to challenge us to, to stay on the offensive. 
Yes, have some defensive there, but yes, let's stay on the offensive. Let's keep sharing our faith. Just imagine if, if 86 disciples in Southland share our faith with two people. Just imagine, it's doable. Most of us in the room got more than, more than one friend, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, most of us got, we can manage that. That's manageable, two people. Some of us got more than, more than one kid. We can manage that, right? And so, just imagine that 86 sold out disciples in Southland go after two Bible studies. It would, oh my goodness, God would do immeasurably more. That's already right there alone, over 100 studies. But some of us, we think we can't do it because of opposition. We just focus where we at. But like, what if you could do it? Right. We forget that narrative. What if you actually could do it? Yeah. And here's the thing. You actually can. Yeah. Yeah. You actually can. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Point number three, as I come around the corner, yeah. keeping hope alive for your families. Let's go back to Nehemiah 4. Amen. Keeping hope alive for your families. Look at verse 13. It says, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posted them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. To fight for your family. And it made me think, well, why family? For many of us in this room, family is everything. It's everything. It's everything. Come on, Tyree. That's why Jesus even says, hey, if you don't love me more than you love your mom, your dad, if you're on life, like he understood this concept because people love their family so much. But however, we need to fight for our families. A lot of us will do just about anything for our family. Yeah. If our family need a kidney, we'll give them a kidney and a drop of a dime. Yeah. I mean, I still need a toenail. If anyone <laughs> want to give me a toenail or have a full surgery, I'm here. <laughs> I mean, that's why stories of moms displaying incredible strength and incredible, and incredible courage protecting their babies. Yeah. It's, it's stories of literally women lifting up cars to protect their child. Because they understand the concept of family. I mean, even men, they were fight to the death just to protect their families. Even across seas right now, we see it, it's a war. And for some, it's very patriotic where they're taking a stance because they understand they're fighting literally for their family. When we fight for our family, it gives us a purpose. It, it gives us hope. It gives us meaning. That we understand it's not just about me. Salvation is not just for me. If it was just for me, they call that what? Selfishness. Mm, yeah. God called us to be selfless. So salvation is not just for me, but it's for everyone around me. Yeah. That's God's heart. Amen. And so when we fight for family, guess what? It becomes personal. Mm, yes. Oh, you want to talk to my mama like that? <laughs> oh, let me take off my shoe. Hey, hey, you know? Oh, you going to talk to, you going to talk to uh, Mama Lisa like that? Wait a minute. Nah. Hold on, bro. Hey, bro, I got to talk to Wait, you going to talk to my brother Paul that way? And his wife? You going to disrespect him in their oh, home? In their home. Wait a minute. Why? Because we take it personal. Right. Yeah. Honestly, I'm grateful. I don't know about you guys, but I'm so grateful for the kingdom. Yeah. Because it's family. Yes. Right. And you got to think about it. Man, like, any church, for some of us, how many of us grew up going to church? Just on a show of hands. Now, how many of us, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. How many of us actually believe that everyone in that church obeyed the Bible? And that's crazy. A lot of us grew up going to church, but yet we understand that nobody in the church has actually obeyed the Bible. But I'm so grateful to be a part of a kingdom, a church of God that actually takes the Bible seriously. Amen. We understand his family. Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful even for the church by like, using the biblical principles to fight for family. We have this, this principle and this, this, this no church left behind. It's like a military term, no, no, nobody left behind, right? That's right? And it is a battle. It's a family, but at the same time, it's an army. Right. And so it's a spiritual one. And it's a spiritual battle where Satan is fighting, but guess what? We're fighting back. Right. 
I'm so proud of how our church responded to help the needs of different churches all around the world. I mean, even in Denver, they got hit hard at one point back in the, back, back, back a couple of years ago, and they had 33 total disciples at the time. But because we're a family, we fight for each other. Now the church is over 50 sold out disciples. The church in Hilo and Honolulu got hit very hard at one point. Leadership, all this stuff changed. But yet, because we're a family, we take care of each other, and now that church is going to raise over 100 disciples total in a Hawaii church, amen? Even in Mexico City, with a church around 150 disciples, but now because of a family, and we understand the convictions of that, the church is now over 200 disciples. Yeah. But some of us could be like, well, that's back there. What about here in Southland? What about here in Southland? We're in the LA church. I'm glad that we serve an awesome God, first and foremost. Yeah. But we can take those same principles and we dwell it down to our respective ministry. Yeah. And that's been happening. I'm so yeah. grateful for the Kernans, so grateful for the Antelons and the, the Kirstners, and, and really putting that here in the LA church that no region is left behind. Not just, not just any church left behind, but no region left behind. Amen. And we started here in Southland. Southland took a hit just due to transitions and just due really to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, even though we probably got knocked down, but we're not knocked out. Amen. You follow me? Yeah, that's right. We may have got knocked down, but we're not knocked out. You know, how do I know that? Guess what? You guys are here in this room right now, Amen. fighting, Amen. fighting. We're in a pandemic, but we're still fighting. We're still faithful. And because of that, God is starting to bless this region again. I mean, I was kind of looking at it, I was praying. Uh, since January, our region has already seen nine incredible additions. Amen? <laughs> and now you do the math, it's only in the month of March. It's only in the month of March. And that's already three additions per month. And that's just March. I believe and wholeheartedly believe God's going to do immeasurably more. Amen. Immeasurably more. Because of you guys here in this room. Amen. You know, we have so much to be grateful for. But also, we've got to make sure that we continue to keep hope alive by fighting for our families. Yeah. By fighting for not just your family within your home, but fighting for their family and your brother and sister to the right and to the left of you. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Right now, we're around 80-some disciples. Eventually, we're going to be so packed, we can't even fit in this room. Yeah. That's the vision. Yeah. Come on, bro. That's where we're going. Yeah, yeah. And I believe we could do that. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You know, as I conclude... Let us keep hope alive during times of brokenness and downfall, but also let us keep hope alive during opposition, and let us keep hope alive as we continue to fight for our families. With that, I love you guys. To God be all the glory.